and this hyperdrive variety maps to the uh, same thing where we take the trivial character. Uh, and it's a resolution um, under our assumption that, that, uh, that this lambda naught is unimodular. So, the, so that's where the geometry comes from. This uh, sublattice together with the choice of generic character and generic co-character. Uh, so it's a, uh, so we have this alpha and alpha, and we also have um, an action of C star coming from from this choice of xi. So the uh, the data of so the datum uh, lambda naught alpha and xi define this hypertoric variety together with a, a C star action on it. And the, um, this datum also, also defines uh, a, what they call, linear program. It is called the linear program, where, um, which is an, as I said, an affine hyperplane arrangement. Namely, we can take uh, and the space lambda naught tensor R. So this is a real vector space. Uh, it's a subspace of um, R to the I. And then consider it's shift by alpha. Uh, so this is some affine subspace of R to the I. And by intersecting, by considering the intersection of V with the standard uh, coordinate hyperplanes, we get a collection of, of hyperplanes indexed by our index set. Uh, and the uh, xi defines an objective functional. So some um, so the pictorially we, we have a uh, we have our, our space V and then inside of it we have some hyperplanes and some choice of a uh, so maybe this is one, two, three, four hyperplanes um, and then some linear functional, which I'll draw as a dotted line and an arrow where the dotted line um, denotes the uh, a level set for our functional. This is our xi. And the choice of alpha uh, determines how, how the hyperplanes are moved uh, within V. Theorem of um, Braden, Mikata, Proudfoot, Webster. That, well, that, so they define uh, hypertoric category O. Uh, associated to lambda naught alpha and xi um, and show that O, this category O is um, equivalent to representations or modules for uh, some finite dimensional algebra. Finite dimensional algebra um, which is where uh, this algebra is um, quasi-hereditary. Uh, 
meaning that the representation theory is, is highest weight, uh, and Kazool. So it has a kind of hidden grading, well, it has a, a grading. Um, and that the, they show that the, the causal dual is um, the category O for the, it's called the Gale dual. So um, we can take the perpendicular lattice, uh, lambda not perp, and then switch the roles of alpha and psi. And this is the Gale dual data. Um, and so this, this picture looks a lot like um, the integral regular blocks of uh, ordinary category O. And the, here the, the simple objects in O lambda not alpha psi are uh, labeled by chambers. Um, in the hyperplane arrangement. So the picture we had above, we have our, our direction psi, and they're labeled by the chambers that are um, bounded above, um, bounded by psi. So uh, here if we take, so here's a chamber that's bounded by psi. So we have one, two, three, four, five chambers that are bounded by psi, where psi takes a, a maximum value. Um, and uh, moreover, they show that for any, um, so uh, as alpha and psi vary, um, the, the corresponding categories are uh, derived Merida equivalent. Um, and they're related by, by certainly certain uh, shuffling or twisting functors. So um, now uh, the, to, to switch to the Schur algebra side, um, with Tom Braden, starting with uh, the same data, so but just the sublattice lambda naught as above, and now k any field. We show that the category of T equivariant perverse sheaves on M naught with coefficients in K. So here we look at perverse sheaves that are constructible with respect to the simple, uh, with respect to the symplectic leaves. That's what this C stands for. Then the, the resulting category is equivalent to uh, modules over some finite dimensional algebra um, where this is a, again a um, k is a finite dimensional algebra um, what should we call it hypertoric sure algebra um, that this algebra is uh, is quasi hereditary
And um, with, so for a quasi-hereditary algebra, there's the notion of a ringle dual. And the ringle dual is the same algebra, but for the, the Gale dual um, central arrangement. So we take the, the orthogonal complement. Um, now, uh, and then as I mentioned before, in fact, we can define um, define this uh, here, lambda not for any matroid. So we can um, this this notion generalizes to any matroid. And um, in case you haven't seen matroids before, uh, um, so uh, matroids are a kind of a combinatorial notion that encodes uh, the kind of essence of what it means to be independent or linearly independent. So suppose suppose E is a um, finite subset. So a finite set of vectors in Rd uh, that spans, so a finite spanning set. Then uh, what well we can consider the set of subsets, subsets of E um, that form a basis for Rd. And uh, the, so note, first that this um, set is not empty. And secondly, that the, uh, there's a sort of exchange axiom. So if x and y are two um, bases, and x is an element, little x is an element in x minus y, then uh, there exists a y in y minus x, such that when we remove little x from x and add little y, uh, we get another basis. Um, so this, uh, these two axioms uh, define the notion of a matroid. So this is a notion due to um, Nakasawa and independently um, Whitney in um, about 1935 that a set E um, endowed with a set of subsets B is a matroid if these two axioms hold. So if um, B1 and B2 hold. So, uh, of course, so examples. Well, the, the first class of examples are linear matroids. So, um, oops. Uh, if, so, so here, linear matroids meaning, so E in, B as above, e, a collection of vectors in, in Rd that span. Um, another example, we could look at what are called graphical matroids. So for G a graph, 
let um, let E be the set of edges of G and B be the set of spanning trees. Spanning forests, I guess. Um, now, uh, in fact, uh, two, the graphical matroids are special cases of, of linear matroids. Um, but the, this gives a way of seeing graphs as, um, as matroids. And uh, these are the, the sorts of matroids that are easiest to, to describe, but the, um, and are kind of, I guess, the motivating cases, but uh, somehow they're uh, not indicative of matroids. And so theorem of, of um, Nelson in 2018 that had been predicted much, much earlier that almost all matroids are not linear. So while they're the, the ones that uh, we're most familiar with, they're not the most common. Uh, and we can also define, define matroids in, in a number of other ways in terms of their, for example, their um, set of independent sets. So meaning subsets of bases. Or we could define them in terms of their circuits, uh, meaning minimal dependencies, sets of minimal dependencies. Um, or in terms of the flats, so the meaning um, span sets. And uh, Like the um, like the the sublattices we talked about earlier, there's a notion of duality. So there's also matroid duality. Um, so given a matroid, we can consider uh, what we denote as M star. Which has the same underlying set, but now the we take as um, our new uh, our new set of bases to be the um, complements of the original ones. And uh, this is also a matroid. the dual matroid. Mm, for example, if um, for the graphical matroid, if your graph is planar, then the uh, dual matroid is the, uh, the graphical matroid corresponding to the, the dual planar graph. Um, and uh, so note, that um, so this seems perhaps different from what we talked about earlier. If you start with a sublattice um, lambda naught as before, then one gets a matroid by considering the um, the set of um, the images of the the um, standard dual vectors. in uh, lambda not tensor r dual. So where um, phi is the dual of the inclusion. Um, And so this brings us back to um, the uh, matroidal Schur algebras. 
So we define um, for any metroid um, M a uh, metroidal shared algebra RK of M uh, such that RK of um, and the knot is RK of the corresponding matroid. And um, again, so like, why why is this interesting? The the point is that the um, these algebras encode interesting enum enumerative, um, well known invariants of matroids, and that when the characteristic of P is the characteristic of K is positive then uh, we get new um, versions of these of these invariants so some sort of p canonical versions um, and so this gives new invariants of matroids as well, new as far as i know um, and one question which motivates uh, the rest of the talk is um, is there a natural uh, Q sure algebra or a natural Q, Q deformation of, of this uh, matroidal sure algebra. Um, and to uh, describe some work towards the answer, um, I'll just say that this algebra RK of M is defined uh, as a, as the subalgebra of the endomorphisms of some large vector space. Large vector space. Um, uh, generated by certain um, operators And their inverses, uh, sorry, and their adjoints. And um, observation is that this um, the vector space B, um, this big vector space is um, the K group. The Grunt D group of um, of a hypertoric category O when um, when M is comes from uh, such a lattice when the knot uh, and this um, and and the operators uh, that define the, this subalgebra, this R of M, um, are in bijection with the finite dimensional simple objects in O. Uh, so in uh, work in progress with um, Jens Eberhardt, we um, categorify Um, R of length and not using a category of hypertoric um, Harishandra by modules. Um, and uh, then as uh, o lambda not alpha xi is um, Krasul, we uh, expect to use the grading to be able to um, define a, a Q version 
of this RK lambda naught. Uh, and now, so that would, um, if we're able to pull this off, then the, the um, we have a nice definition for uh, these linear, for linear cases. Uh, and we can ask the question, what about the nonlinear setting? For M nonlinear. And uh, our um, so idea um, is that when M is orientable, we'll say what that means in a moment, um, we can still to find some notion of category O. So the, the setting is the setting of oriented matroids. Um, and to motivate this, I'd like to uh, consider an example. So given, we saw that given a, um, a graph, one gets a matroid. And so if we consider an oriented graph, so for example, consider the following graph. So a graph with um, five edges, A, B, C, D, E. Um, we can, uh, we observe that the circuits well, the circuits are um, B, C, D, and B, C, E and DE, the circuits in this graph. And the, the circuits can be, um, can be given orientations. And so we can go around a circuit and ask, do the, do the, which of the arrows agree with the, the orientation and which disagree? So we get uh, oriented circuits. So if we go around, uh, say, the ABC, the, the BCD circuit um, clockwise, then we get B. Uh, it's going in the same direction as B and C, um, but opposite direction to D. So we, we draw a bar over the D. Um, for BCE, um, we see that it's going in the same direction for all of them. And EE, it's going in the same direction for all of them. If we take the we could also go around in, in the other direction, and then we um, we get bars for the for the elements we hadn't barred before, and vice versa. Okay, and um, so an oriented matroid can be defined in a number of ways, but um, one way is in terms of its, um, as a set uh, of oriented circuits. Um, and so we think of a oriented circuit as being uh, an element um, in the set zero plus minus to the i. And so for each element in I, we, it's either not in the circuit, and then we put a zero. It's in the circuit with a positive orientation, we put a plus, or it's in the circuit with a negative orientation, and we put a minus. Um, and a rather um, amazing theorem is that, uh, so there's a topological realization theorem 
of um, of Folkman and Lawrence. I'm going to misspell his name. Um, that says that uh, oriented matroids can be um, can be represented topologically um, as an arrangement of what are called pseudospheres. So um, meaning a collection S E, where E runs over some parameter set E of uh, D minus one spheres um, S E embedded in um, a standard D dimensional sphere S D uh, such that um, the complement of the image of any any such sphere is uh, homeomorphic to uh, two two disks and so we can call one the, the positive side and the other the negative side um, so we make a choice for any e and u uh, and these should satisfy uh, a couple of axioms. I'll just give the first one. Is that the um, if we intersect any um, collection for any um, collection of these pseudospheres, uh, the result should be uh, again a sphere. Topologically, a sphere. Um, so the um, the idea is that uh, we could represent uh, one of these oriented matroids as being um, a collection of these kind of wiggly spheres. Whoops, um, going through. Um, lying on on a bigger sphere, so uh, so it's kind of we could think of these as being like hyperplanes, but the hyperplanes can wiggle, um, and uh, so this this hints um, at how uh, one can can do uh, linear programming um, or nonlinear programming um, via oriented matroids. So uh, an oriented matroid program Um, is an oriented matroid until the GF um, with two distinguished elements. G and F, where G plays the role of um, the role of alpha and f plays the role of xi. And uh, so the um, we can look at so if we look at just the upper hemisphere of our 
of our sphere, then maybe it looks like something like um, like this. And we think of the uh, this equator as corresponding to the element G. Um, and then our, our element F will be some other hyperplane or pseudosphere here. So it, it looks like a similar sort of picture. And now uh, in joint work in joint work with my student um, Ethan Koalenka. We um, for so oops. theorem uh, for G um, and F sufficiently generic um, and the choice of um, some com commutative algebra data called the linear system of parameters for the um, matroidal face ring of the um, unoriented, underlying unoriented matroid. Um, let's call that U. Um, we define a uh, category O, or we define a, a, a finite dimensional algebra A M tilde uh, G F U, um, which generalizing generalizing um, the algebra of Braden, Nakata, Proudfoot, Webster, um, and uh, we show that um, so with so now the simple objects are uh, are labeled by um, f bounded and so the notion of chambers here becomes topes in the oriented matroid language um, and if the program The oriented matroid program M tilde FG is uh, Euclidean, which is a condition um, on, on such an oriented matroid program that says that uh, if we look at our, uh, our oriented matroid program, so here let's look at the picture I drew above, um, we can label these points on the boundary as having uh, either F being taking a positive or a negative value depending on which side of uh, F it lies on. So here we have F pointing in this direction. So we'll, uh, these points will have negative values and then these will have positive. And we can consider um, for every, uh, every such intersection point, um, the uh, one dimensional segments going out of them and we'll orient them in the direction from um, plus to minus. And then this gives us a way of again um, saying which chambers are, are bounded uh, and it also gives us this directed graph uh, on those uh, set of edges. Um, and the program is Euclidean if that, that graph has no, uh, no directed cycles. Um, so the so if it's Euclidean, then uh, M. So that this algebra is um, is 
quasi hereditary. And um, and causal. Um, so as a to con concluding remarks, um, if uh, the program is not is not Euclidean, um, and it, it seems that the um, algebra is not uh, is not quasi hereditary. Um, but we don't know, uh, don't know about Kazool, whether it's Kazool. Um, and in, so work in progress, so we, we hope to, hope to show um, that uh, it, as we we vary um, f and g to be generic, um, that uh, the algebra is uh, or the resulting algebras are uh, derived Merida equivalent. And we have some we have some partial results in this direction, but um, not as strong as we'd like. So th thank you for your attention. Thank you, Carl. Uh, are there questions? Um, yeah, can I ask a question? Sure. So, yeah. Hi. So. Um, First about uh, the Schur algebra, from what you said about uh, the hypertoric case, it sounded like it plays a role similar to the Hecke algebra, um, you know, to the role that Hecke algebra plays in the classical theory <clears throat> of the algebra category. But in that case, you kind of, um, you, you emphasize a different analogy where you have a Schur algebra defined from the important cone. So I had a little bit of, I mean, this is not a little bit unclear to me, like what? So, uh, so inside of the Schur algebra, you have a, a piece that's um, that like the um, uh, group algebra of the vial group. Mm -hmm. uh, and so uh, the um, the hope is by by uh, getting this Q version, we'll have a, a, a sort of Hecke Hecke algebra in this in this setting. But uh, but you said that in this the Schur algebra acts on the Grotten the group of category or in this hypertoric setting, and that uh, the uh, basis is, is in bijection with irreducible objects of category or. That's the properties that um, hold for Hecke algebra in the case of uh, in the real algebra case. Yeah. So the um, because we we have the the un kind of currently have the ungraded version of that. Mm -hmm. um, so it, it's like the the group group algebra as opposed to the um, Hecke right. algebra. But still, Schur algebra is bigger than the well. Yeah, yeah. So the the um, I mean, uh, kind of I'm I'm happy. So we define the Schur algebra by looking at this bigger thing. But you can you can restrict to looking at a smaller picture where you just consider the um, like so you just consider a single category O instead of a bunch of category Os for different um, for these. Different flats, the um, yeah. So, so really, I guess the picture is you. You don't have a single category O, but you have a bunch of category Os, and then um, functors between them. Mm -hmm. And if you consider a single one, then you you get um, 
you get a picture like the, the hack algebra. And if you consider these multiple ones, then you get something like the, the Schur algebra or the Q Schur algebra. And, and so another question in this um, thing that you talked about in the end. Uh, so the um, theory where you start with an oriented metroid, do you also have an analog of um, Schur algebra acting on the K group of category or and um, corresponding functors? Uh, uh, how much of that theory or that picture is present here? Uh, I mean, the, the hope is that it will maybe all be present here, but uh, it's, it's still work in progress. Thank you. May I ask a question also? Yes, of course. So, uh, so, so is it, uh, is there any idea of what the decomposition matrices are for these categories? Uh, so, um, <laughs> I agree. Uh, the, um, the, meaning, sorry, the multiplicities of simples in uh, standards. Ah, uh, um, so for for the uh, oriented matroid programs setting or the yeah, yes. category O. Yeah, so the category O setting. If you look at um, simples and standards, uh, they're uh, they're very they're very simple. They're um, they're either zero or one, and you can look at the um, so for example here you have. Um, if you look at this chamber, the simple cor corresponding to that chamber, and consider the um, all uh, all chambers that kind of lie below it or lie in the cone of its maximal point, then um, those will each uh, the 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 standard corresponding to to the, the this red region um, will have multiplicity one for each. Um, simple in this cone and zero for the others. So I think that's sorry. So Carl, could I ask, are are you willing to uh send me the uh I'm not sure what to call it, the the sequence of slides, whatever that Sure, the, the PDF, yeah. The PDF, yes. I, I can put that on the website with the video. I, I should admit in advance that I neglected to start the recording until 20 minutes into the talk, 15 minutes into the talk. Um, but I, I think with the PDF, it should be very good. And anyway, the very best part of the talk was the last 30 seconds. <laughs> Okay, so thank you very much, and I'll see you all next week. Thank you. <laughs> thank you.